everyone. Today we are going to be reviewing this MTH Rail King Pennsylvania Railroad M1A here on Brendan's Trains. Before I talk about the history of this locomotive, I do want to talk about a little story that's behind this engine. Now normally I do not talk about the story of locomotives I get, but this engine is special to me personally because this was my very first command control locomotive. Up until 2015, I was 100% conventionally equipped. So this locomotive is pretty special to me. It looks great, it sounds great, and it runs great. Now, originally this locomotive had PS2 installed, the 5-volt board. But four years of having it, the board blew on it, and it remained on display until 2020 when I sent it off to MTH to get PS3 installed in it. Now, I just want to make this clear, even though it has PS3 in it, the sounds are the exact same as when I first got it. Let's now go into the history of the Pennsylvania M1s. Now, the M1 was a 4A2 type steam locomotive. In case if you don't know what 4A2 means, it means for the wheel configuration on the engine. So this means we have four wheels up on the lead truck, eight drive wheels in the middle, and two wheels underneath the cab and firebox for support. Now, 482s were normally called mountain-type locomotives, and they're mainly used for dual purpose, which means they can pull both passenger trains and freight trains. So the first M1 was built in 1923 and went through three years of extensive testing before the PRR would choose that as their dual-purpose locomotive. Now, these locomotives had 72-inch diameter driving wheels, which at the time they were considered too small for passenger, yet too big for freight. But all that proved the M1s wrong, and they proved to be fantastic in freight trains and passenger trains. So between 1926 and 1930, the Pennsylvania ordered 300 more mountains. These 301 locomotives were built by Lima Baldwin and the Pennsylvania's own Juniata Shops in Altoona. Now, there are three types of M1s, the M1s, the M1As, and the M1Bs. The M1s being the first, the M1As having slightly more improvements, and the M1Bs being the most modern version of the engine. Now, the difference in boiler pressure between the three was that the M1s and the M1As had 250 pounds per square inch boiler pressure, and that caused them to have 64,550 pounds of tractive effort, while the M1Bs, on the other hand, had an extended 270 pounds per square inch boiler pressure, and that caused the profound effect of giving the engines 69,700 pounds of tractive effort. The M1s had a 210F75 series tender, now, the tenders often weighed more than the M1s themselves, including some other engines that are put behind. The Pennsylvania Railroad M1s remained in service until 1957, when all of them were retired. Today, one and a half M1s still remain today. The tender of number 6659 is currently being used for the new rebuild project of T1 number 5550, while the single M1 that's still around is M1B number 6755, and it's currently at the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. Now that you know the history of the M1s, let's talk about this model. Now the model we have here is the very first time MTH released the Pennsylvania Railroad M1. They didn't even make a Protosound 1 version in Premier or Rail King. So this locomotive was re released in 2000, and they only made just this row number, number 6743 here, and they made one with PS2 and Loco Sound. But we're not talking about the Loco Sound, we're talking about the PS2 version. Here's a couple stats of this engine. This engine is 25 and a half inches long. It's almost 26 or 27 inches if you count the couplers. 
then the engine and tender combined weight is over 11 pounds so this thing's pretty heavy now the minimum required curve to run this locomotive is 031 but we can expect that because this is a rail king locomotive so you're not going to have as much detail as a premier line locomotive but it really doesn't matter because this is still a solid engine nonetheless now there's two ways to operate this locomotive you can either run it with the mth dcs command system as that will give you access to all of the engine's advanced features However, you can also run it conventionally with just a transformer and some track. Let's now take a closer look at the details of this engine. Here's the look on the front of the engine. We have a metal coupler right here, some suicide steps on either side of the pilot. We have a gasoline tank right here. Then above it, we have a walkway. Then on the front of the boiler, we have some very nice rivet detailing. Then we have a keystone number plate. Now, even though this was a freight locomotive mostly, it did not have the round number plate, which is common on most freight locomotives. Then above the keystone number plate, we have a molded and grab iron right here. Then above it, we have an operational headlight right here with lighted number boards on either side. Here's a look inside the smoke box. We have some nice rivet detailing right here. We have the beginning of the two separately applied metal handrails that go all the way length of the boiler. We have one of the two molded in marker lights. Now back then, MTA should not do separately applied marker lights on these rail key engines until the early to mid 2010s. Now, what I don't like about this locomotive is that this thing does not have a builder's plate, even though there's a spot that shows where the builder's plate is supposed to be. Here is a look on the sides of the engine. We have a lead truck right here with some brake shoe assemblies. Then above it, we have a very nicely detailed full cylinder with some riveting. Then right here, we have the drive wheels and the drive rods, and all this stuff looks great when the engine is in motion. You'll see that in just a little bit. And above it, we have some nice molded in piping and some molded in detail right here. Here's the rear of the engine. We have the trailing wheels right here. It looks very nicely detailed. Then above it, we have the bell pair firebox that was common on most PRR engines and even some great northern engines. Then on the cab, we have a very nicely crisp 6743 right here. Some nice rivet detailing alongside. We have some separately applied metal grab irons on either side of the cab. Now inside the cab, there's no figures in there, surprisingly. There's a modestly detailed back head, but there is a lighted firebox glow in there. Here's a look on the left-hand side of the engine. Now, it looks pretty much the same as the right-hand side, but we do have some differences in detail. Here's a look on top of the engine. We have the dynamo generator right here. There's a smokestack, and there is a fan-driven smoke unit down in there. And as always, to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit, you simply pour the smoke fluid directly down the stack. Now, behind the smokestack, we have a very nice feed water heater right here. Now this is what difference the M1A and the M1, because the M1s never had this feed water heater right here, but the M1As and the M1Bs had it. Then we have a little nice silver bell right here that moves, but it doesn't really need to move because all M1s had automatic bells, I believe. Then behind the bell, we have a very nicely detailed sand dome. Behind the sand dome, we have the steam dome, and there's a silver whistle right here. Then behind the whistle, we have some separately applied silver pop-off valves. There's only two on this engine, surprisingly. And then we have some very nicely molded in detail right here. On top of the cab, we have some nice rivet detailing. Now there's a vent, but unfortunately it does not open. It's just molded in. Here's a look on the inside of the cab. Now, like I said, it's modestly detailed. There's nothing painted, but the detail is there. And then in the middle, we have the red firebox glow right here. Hey. That takes care of the engine. Now let's check out the tender. I really like the tender on this thing because in real life and on the models, the tenders basically were as big as the engines themselves and often weighed more. But on the sides of the tender, we have a very nicely crisp Pennsylvania on either side. Some very nicely detailed trucks right here, but they do not have chains on them for some reason. Here's a look on the front of the tender. We have some nice door detailing right here. Then we have some metal grab irons along either side of the tender. 
and then we have some nice molded step detailing. Here's a look on top of the tender. We have a metal co-load right here. We have some water hatches on either side, but they do not open. They're just molded in. We have some nice rivet detailing right here. Then on the back of the tender, we have a metal doghouse. Finally, here's a look on back of the tender. We have the doghouse I mentioned earlier. Then we have the molded in ladder. Then we have the backup light right here that lights up with the operational marker lights. Then on the bottom, we have an electrocoupler that can be fired from the DCS or from the transformer. All right, the last thing we're going to do before I start this engine up is to mention my favorite feature on this engine. My favorite feature is an easy pick. It's the whistle. It sounds great. They did a fantastic job with it. I listened to some recordings of the M1's whistle and it does sound pretty close. So yeah, my favorite feature of the engine is the whistle. Alright, let's go ahead and start her up. Now I'm going to use the extended startup sequence on this engine. the fan driven smoke I talked about. This thing smokes a lot. Check the level of the tender, will ya? Water level down six feet. Bring that spot over. All right, first up, let's check out the whistle. Here's the forward signal. The reverse signal. Now, unfortunately, there's no crossing sound on this thing because back in the early 2000s in these PS2 engines, they did not have the crossing signal. But that's all right. Here's the bell. All right, let's go ahead and move her on out.
switchman signaling us to stab it here. Looks like they're going to cut the order. Go get your order, set out. Thanks. Ready for the brake test. Set your brake. it up for this review this is a great engine i'm happy to own it it's a heck of a lot of fun to run now if you're interested in purchasing one of these the retail price back then was 430 dollars but nowadays you can still find them on ebay however they're all sold out in all the model train stores from every number but there is also the new versions that came out in 2020 and if you're lucky some of the shops might have some of those in stock and they go for around $500, but they do not have the same sounds as this thing. Anyways, that's it for now. This is Brendan's Trains, signing off.